Okay, I think we're going to start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Why Transform Your Clinical Practice, and more so, what's in it for me? My name is Kaylin Henderson, and I'll be your facilitator today. At this time, all attendee lines are muted for this session to minimize background noise and distractions. We welcome your questions and input throughout this presentation, so please feel free to use the raise hand icon in your taskbar or submit questions and comments in the chat box provided. Today's presentation will include polling questions in addition to our short survey at the end. We encourage everyone's participation as we value your interaction. Today's presentation will also be recorded and later uploaded to our Health Visions of Marva PTN YouTube channel. And you may find that link on the flyer included in the invite to today's webinar, or simply typing Health Visions of Marva PTN in YouTube search bar. Today we are privileged to have two special speakers, and at this time I would like to introduce each of them individually. First we have Carol Greenlee, MD, FACE, FACP, a part of the National Faculty Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, TCPI, and participating clinician at West Slope Endocrinology, Grand Junction, Colorado. Dr. Greenlee co-chaired the American College of Physicians ACP Medical Neighborhood work group and was lead author of the ACP position paper, The Patient-Centered Medical Home Neighbor, The Interface of Patient-Centered Medical Home with Specialty Subspecialty Practices. She chaired the ACP work group on high value care coordination and the pediatric to adult care transition initiative. She currently chairs the ACP Council of Subspecialty Societies, CSS, with a seat on the Board of Regents. In 2014, her solo endocrinology practice achieved Tier 3 NCQA patient-centered specialty practice, PCSP, recognition as an early adopter, and she currently serves as faculty for the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, as we all know as TCPI. And secondly, we have our very own Edward R. Sobel, DO, Health Vision Delmarva's PTN Practice Advisor. For those of you joined our previous uh, webinars in the past, you may remember that Dr. Sobel is a retired senior partner, managing director, and was the family physician at the Family Practice Associates in Wilmington, Delaware. He is currently the medical director of the Healthcare Quality Improvement Program for Quality Insights of Delaware, the State Quality Improvement Organization, as well as for the Delaware Regional Extension Center. Dr. Sobel is a senior attending staff member and executive committee member of the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Christiana Care Systems, Wilmington, Delaware, and is board certified in family practice. His awards include the 2001 Family Physician of the Year by the Delaware Academy of Family Physicians and the 1995 Preceptor of the Year for his Christiana Care Health System. He received the 2011 Daniel A. Alvarez MD Service Award from the Medical Society of Delaware for helping implement over 1,000 physicians on electronic medical records. In 2012, he was certified as Clinician Practitioner Consultant, HIT Professional, by the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information. Dr. Greenlee and Dr. Stowe, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, Dr. Greenlee did ask me to uh, address today's agenda. So for today on the agenda, we have first-person experience, one specialty, one specialty practice journey in transforming for improved clinical care. We're going to review and remove reimbursement for quality, accelerating the need for change. And then we'll touch on a new approach and how the PTN can help um, you guys and what's in it for me with them. Okay, at this time I'm going to go ahead and pass the presentation over to Dr. Greenlee. This might put us in a quick waiting room until she ends up. Thank you. Dr. Hey. Kaylin, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin, and thank all of you for joining today. I suspect that some of you got bombarded with join TCPI, the payment model is changing, you don't want a penalty, you need to get ready. And as a clinician, all you're thinking is the last thing I need is another acronym. I know this is how I felt when I first started hearing MACRA. Uh, APM, MIPS, QPs, I thought, you've got to be kidding. Get me out of here. 
So instead of chasing you around with acronyms, I'd like to take a step back and have you think about these two questions. What do you love about what you do in your field in medicine? And what gets in your way and makes it hard? And I know for me as an endocrinologist, I actually love helping someone whose diabetes is out of control or whose thyroid is uh, raging or has a pituitary problem. I love helping them get things back in control and feeling better and feeling better about themselves. And it seems to me what gets in my way is how we do things. And in fact, in 2001, the Institute of Medicine released its report, Crossing the Quality Chasm, and it said that our current healthcare model did get in our way. It made it harder for us to deliver care. And that care ended up being disorganized, fragmented, and falling short on quality, meaning some people got exceptional quality, but other people didn't get the care they needed. And it was the underlying characteristics of the model we were using that made it harder for us. The acute care model, the ER, come in when you're sick, made it hard to do preventive care and chronic care. The physician-centered model, where the physician is responsible for knowing everything, doing everything, assuming all the responsibility, and hiring staff to support the physician, put the patient in the room for the physician, uh, schedule for the physician, was overloading our doctors and causing burnout, and then being separated in silos of care was causing that disconnected, fragmented care. And I know in my practice, it was making it a lot harder for me to deliver the kind of care I wanted. And I'll show you some examples. The first is a 70-year-old woman who'd driven in to see me from out of town, but didn't know why she was referred. And I didn't know why she was referred. I received no records and couldn't get through to her primary care doctor. So I started pointing to my head. Is it your pituitary? My neck? Is it your thyroid? My arm? Is it osteoporosis? But she didn't know. As I took the history, I learned she was taking medications for diabetes and thyroid. So I discussed diabetes and thyroid. I ordered an A1C and a TSH. And the next day, when the faxed records arrived, it really wasn't much of a surprise that the results I got were identical to the results of the A1C and TSH done two weeks before. The surprise was that she'd been referred for an adrenal mass. This wasn't good for her, and it was a huge mess for me on the back end trying to straighten all this out. The second is a 28-year-old female who had her appointment booked by her primary care practice. As a specialist, it's not unusual to get one word or two word referrals. Pulmonologists get lungs, ophthalmologists get vision or eyes, and endocrinologists get endocrine disorder, or in her case, fatigue. Again, no records were sent. And after waiting three months, we both figured out that she needed rheumatology and I'm an endocrinologist. This was really bad for her. She now had a five-month wait to get in with the rheumatologist, and it wasn't good for me or my practice. The next case is a 74-year-old woman with cognitive impairment brought from a skilled nursing facility by the transport person with only the medication administration record. We couldn't reach the referring physician, but we have a health information exchange. So I dug around in that, 94 pages of reports. I learned she had diabetes, a small pituitary mass, and osteoporosis, but I still didn't know why she was referred. What kind of note do you write for this? I didn't really do anything. And how do you bill for this? Quite the mess. So I don't know if any of these situations sound familiar to you, but in 2008, Tom, Dr. Tom Bodenheimer said, failures in care coordination are common and can create serious quality concerns. In fact, a number of surveys have shown that 60 to 70 percent of the time, specialists receive no information. And even when they get that information, it's often not helpful. I know in my practice, not getting the information was making it really hard for me to deliver the kind of care that my patients needed. My front desk person was getting tired of me pounding on her, please get the records. So we decided to do a survey to see how bad it really was. We kept track of everything we got with the patient for the next month. 
and we found that at least 50% of the time, critical information was missing. So we wanted to make that better. We designed a little referral form asking for the reason why the patient was referred and the supporting data. We developed a paper log to track the referrals, and we started looking things over, not just before we saw the patient, but before we booked the patient. At the same time, I had the privilege of participating in a work group that became the Medical Neighbor Work Group. And in 2010, we put out the policy paper recommending needed changes for improving the referral process and care coordination. The improvement in care coordination could sort of be jump-started by using care coordination agreements or care compacts. This is a platform that everyone agrees to use about what information needs to be shared, what needs to be communicated. This could be formal, like written down, not like a contract, but just written down, or informal, like I had with my uh, endocrine surgeon. We knew what each other needed. I knew what he was going to do post-op, how he would communicate with me. And then things inside of our practices, our processes, policies, and procedures need to work to allow us to provide uh, the information that we've agreed to share. Dr. Greenlee, would you like to start your first poll? Oh, yes. Thank you, Kaylin. Please do that. Okay. At this time, our first poll will be, how often do your referrals contain a clear clinical question? or a detailed reason for referral. Um, I'm going to give a second for everyone to go ahead and put their answers in. Looks like we're about there with 100%. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a little bit more. OK, I'm going to close this poll. I'm going to share the results. Dr. Greenlee, we had about 8% say nearly always. We had 56% say sometimes, 36% say not often, and 0% saying almost never. Maybe That's pretty know? typical. <laughs> <laughs> so to, um, in 2011, my independent physicians association that I belong to for Mesa County decided to do a care coordination agreement as part of a medical neighbor incentive. And we decided to focus on providing a clinical question and answering the clinical question, as well as being sure that the patient was prepared. Uh, and doing some referral tracking, we came up with this form. This could sort of serve as a checklist. There's even a little box to check that the patient's aware that they were referred and could serve as a referral tracking form. But we didn't make people use this form. They could put it in their EMR however they wanted to do it. And just by having this care coordination agreement, I started to see a big improvement I was getting more of the basic information, such as medication lists, and I was getting a lot better clinical questions. Instead of this one to two word, I was getting more complete clinical questions or reasons for referral and more complete uh, uh, support data. And Kaylin, I think we need another polling question here. Okay, the next one is, are you tracking referrals in your practice? Um, we do, yes, we do routinely. Uh, we are planning to. We haven't considered this yet or n see no value in it. Okay, so I'll give it another couple of seconds for people to finish entering in their data. All right, looks like we're pretty steady where we're at. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and I'll share those results with you guys. Um, Dr. Greenlight says, we have about 55% saying, yes, we do this routinely. 23% uh, we're planning to do so. And 23% we haven't considered this yet. And no, no one had responded with seeing no value. Good. Well, that's great. 55% tracking is wonderful. Um, so a referral is part of taking care of the patient. It's actually an extension of care to meet the patient's needs. And as I started to get better information, I could meet those needs more appropriately. We had uh, a 
we had urgent spots reserved on our schedule, and with better information, we could better match the right patients to those spots. We migrated our paper tracking log to an Excel spreadsheet, and then we sort of risk stratified our patients' referral needs or triaged them into urgent needs, move-up needs, routine, and then we developed a category called short call of people who lived close by and could come on short notice. If we didn't have a patient to fill one of those urgent spots, we could rapidly sort to our move-up list and get those patients moved up. And if we had a patient cancel or no-show at the last minute, we could go to our short call list, get those patients in sooner, which was good for the patient and also good for our practice. Also, as I got more information and better information, I could collaborate and work with the referring physicians better using pre-visit advice or what we call pre-consultation. They could ask me, does this patient even need a referral? Are you the right specialist? Or I could review the records ahead of time to determine that. I could help get the patient prepared better by working with them. And in urgent cases, I could help with the diagnosis and the treatment while the patient was waiting to get into an urgent appointment. And I'll share with you some examples from my practice. I had a man referred from one of the federally qualified health clinics about three hours away for a neck mask. And I could tell by looking at the records that it was not a thyroid mass. It looked like a very large thyroglossal duct cyst. So instead of having him drive those three hours after waiting three or four months for an appointment, I contacted his nurse practitioner and had her redirect to an ENT practice. I also could help patients avoid unnecessary appointments. A lot of people are taking biotin supplements. Biotin interferes with a lot of lab assays for endocrine tests. So if I saw a patient referred for abnormal endocrine test and saw that they were taking biotin or suspected biotin, I could contact the referring doctor, have them hold the biotin, repeat the test, and if the tests were normal, problem solved. If they weren't, I could get the patient in for an appointment. Also, I could help get the patient better prepared for when they came in so that we could move forward better. For instance, a person whose periods had stopped, I knew I was going to need an FSH, estradiol, and prolactin. So while she waited for the appointment, I had her primary care doctor order those tests. So when she came in, we could do more with that time that we had. Or a patient diagnosed with new onset type 1 diabetes, I could help them get the insulin started uh, while I was getting them into an urgent appointment. At San Francisco General Hospital, one of the safety net hospitals, they had a huge delay in getting their patients into specialty clinics. And they started rolling out pre-consult and e-consult. And you can see that the sicker patients were able to get in the clinic with less delay. In the meantime, those other patients were having their needs met through the pre-consult and e-consult. So improving the referral process helps reduce waste, helps reduce risk, but best of all, it improves care for our patients. So instead of walking into the room and saying, now why are you here, and playing charades, I could walk into the room and say, I reviewed your records, now tell me your story, let's get to work and help you. I think one of the best things for me was the improvement in the relationships with those other clinicians that I was working with. This is actually really important to reducing our stress level, improving our job satisfaction and our enjoyment of work. And by working together, we were really creating a system of care and getting out of our silos. And Kaylin, here we have another polling question. Okay, in this quick poll we have, have you utilized a registry or form to remind or ensure patients get a routine testing or treatment to their needs? Um, one is, yes, we're using these tools. Option two, not yet, but we're considering or planning to use. Three is, not have yet planned to use, but we'll consider. And four, do not think these will be useful in our practice. Again, I'll give it a couple seconds before I close the poll. I'm looking pretty steady about now. So um, in sharing those results, Dr. Greenlee, we had 55% saying, yes, we are using these tools. 
Uh, 14 percent had said no, but we're considering planning and using of them. And 32 percent said they have not yet planned to use, but, but they will now consider. That's great. Yeah, that's amazing, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, when the Institute of Medicine put out its report on quality, it said it's not about trying harder. The only reason that care was as good as it was in the United States was that the doctors and nurses in our system worked extra hard. It was like they were pushing upstream. So if we wanted them to be able to do better, we needed to redesign the system of care, not beat on them to work harder. And I've put here the definition of insanity of doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different outcome, and then the definition of transform, to change completely in a good way. And I'm going to give you an example from my practice. I got some of my quality data, and it didn't look so good. In one year, only 27% of my patients with diabetes had a urine microalbumin test done. This meant 73% of my patients weren't getting the care they needed to stay as healthy as they could. Now, my first reaction was, well, you had to miss my data. You didn't get everything. And my second reaction was to hide this and not let anybody see it because I didn't want my staff or anyone else thinking I was a bad, date, a bad doctor. But I did what I knew to do, which was try harder. And it didn't get me very farther. Uh, I was uh, trying harder to remember to order that urine microalbumin, but I'm the classic person with the other overstuffed backpack. I get into the room, I think I'm going to order it, and the patient's having trouble with their insulin pump, they're having low blood sugar, they're having swollen feet, they're having depression, and pretty soon there's a knock, knock, knock on the door, Dr. Greenlee, you're running behind. So I borrowed best practices from primary care. I knew we needed a better process. My current approach of just trying harder on my own wasn't working. So we borrowed team care with my medical assistant having standing orders to order the urine microalbumin. And we replaced my overstuffed backpack with a registry telling us when those items were due. And we got to 93% and kept it there. So we weren't using the data just to turn it in for measurement. We were using the data to let us know if what we were doing was getting the care to our patients in the way they needed it. And if not, it helped guide us on how our improvements were working to get us to where we wanted to be. I knew that when we change a model of care, one of the most important things that we need to change is our mental model, our mindset, the way we think. So I worked really hard with my staff to get them to change from doing tasks to taking care of the patient, to realize that these were their patients, they had a role in the pa patient care, they had accountability for the patient care, and that made a huge difference in how they approached their work and how much they enjoyed their work. And then in our huddles, I would explain why. Why do we work on getting them to quit smoking? Why do we do the urine microalbumin so we can protect them from renal disease and cardiovascular disease? Then we built it into our schedule. We built the medical assistance time for team care, the foot exam, the urine microalbumin. We wrote it down. We made it a policy and a procedure. And we truly worked that registry, getting that work done. I say that we built good intentions into the appointment instead of losing them in the appointment. OK, Kaylin, I think we have one more here. Yeah, the next call is, do you know which quadrant your practice fell into on your last QRUR report? We have three options here with, yes, I've re we've reviewed the quality and utilization position. Um, we have not yet looked at our QRUR, or I've never heard of a QRUR before this. OK, looks like we're pretty set right now. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. And I will share. 
with the results falling with 68% says yes, we reviewed our quarterly and uh, utilized position. 23% uh, we have not yet looked at our QRUR, and 9% that they've never heard of a QRUR before this. Okay, well, I'm going to share some of that with you here in a minute. So the transformation journey, the creating something new and better, is going from that old model that's been getting in our way and making it hard for us to deliver good care to a better model, one that is more comprehensive and continuous, that's centered around a patient-centered care team so that we're sharing the workload with all of us having accountability for taking care of the patient and to a more connected, coordinated uh, system of care. So even without payment reform, we needed a new care model for the, our patients and for ourselves. But now we have payment reform, not just Medicare, but commercial payers and Medicaid are moving to value-based payment models. So we need to deliver care differently. These new models of care with team care, registries, uh, risk stratification aren't supported well by the fee-for-service model. So for them to survive, they need a new payment model to support them. The same way that the new value-based payment models we can't survive if we continue to practice in a volume-based care model. So the payment model and the care delivery models go together. So what is value-based payment? And to try to explain it, I'm going to use the landscaper analogy. If we were going to hire a landscaper a la carte, we would pay for the landscaper, we would pay for the irrigation tubing, and if they cut it all to pieces, we would pay for the new uh, tubing. We would pay for digging the holes, and if they dug too many or too deep, we'd have to pay for that time and work. And if they had too many workers and they worked too slow, we'd have to pay for that. And a bad outcome, you know, the retaining wall and the trees aren't in the right spot, you need to move them, we'd pay for that. And we could either do like the payers have been doing, where you could see, okay, these are drugs that don't work very well, you need a prior auth, and these are our 99214, 99213, you've got to prove that you really needed to do that work. Or we could say, look, this is the job I want, this is what I'm going to pay you to do that job, and then the landscaper is going to have to get his act together. If he keeps cutting tubing and having slow workers, he could uh, lose. But if he gets his act together, becomes more efficient and effective, then he could win or at least break off um, even. So this is how we're moving into payment. You're going to be paid based on your value, with value meaning the quality or the benefit you provide for the cost. And this means the benefit as well in the tests that you order, the treatments that you prescribe. So we want the patients to get the care they need and have better outcomes, and we really want to reduce cost by reducing waste and unnecessary non-beneficial care. So just like the landscaper, as the payment model changes, we need to become more effective and more efficient. And this is a picture of that QRUR report. And think about quality and utilization, which is cost. Whoops. Um, so compared to the other people in your group, are you above average or below average? You want to be above average in quality and below average in cost, and they'll plot us against everyone else. And it's best to be in this right upper quadrant, high quality, low cost, and it's not so good to be in the left lower quadrant, low quality, high cost, and you can see where you are, and then you can do a deep dive to see which elements have you, which elements are you spending more on, which elements do you have lower quality on, and then figure out a way to address those. Um, and I think we've already asked the polling question for this, so I'm going to move on. 
So it's really not about trying harder. It's not about adding more on to do. It's about doing the work differently, having a new approach. It's about looking at your practice data, not just to turn it in for a grade or a score. We're supposed to use that data to let us know if we're delivering care the way we want to deliver care, and then having a method to improve on that care. It's about working as a team to spread the workload and spread the accountability. It's focusing on the patient with a partnership, not as an object of care, and having the patient's voice uh, contribute to the care. And it's about working together, coordinating care, and communicating. Our care has always had a ripple effect, but now with value-based payment, we're united even more, I say like an aspen grove. Each tree in an aspen grove is connected to the other trees through the root system. And if something bad is going on with one of the trees, it's going to spread to all the others. So with value-based payments, if we refer to someone who has uh, high cost, uh, a lot of unnecessary spending or poor quality, it's going to reflect back on us and on others. So as people refer to you, they're going to be saying, is this someone I want to have reflected on what I do? And now I'm going to pass off uh, to Dr. Sobel. Thank you, Dr. Greenlee. So you've heard Dr. Greenlee, and you say to yourself, this sounds good. Uh, you know, maybe this is something we could try for our practice uh, and really begin to face what is really a new era uh, in medical care. So where can you get help? And that's through the uh, PTN, and uh, let's talk about how this would work for you. So where did TCPI come from, uh, kind of the whys and wheres? Uh, if you're familiar with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, this is really a section of CMS uh, which tests out things, uh, looking at ways to improve care, to lower cost, uh, to uh, really help the patients as well as the physicians. And you've seen this through the ACOs, bundled payments, you've heard all of these things. Uh, we're moving, as Dr. Greenlee said, uh, to a merit-based system, an alternate payment models, we're leaving behind the fee-for-service, the SGR, and all the stuff that we've all come to hate as physicians. Uh, and we're really transforming clinical practice uh, from what is episodic care, uh, like you heard about in Dr. Greenlee's beginning, uh, to really a more coordinated uh, care. And so the TCPI is helping to do this, this helping practices make the changes learn which changes were effective or not, and then spread it to other practices. So it's really a learning, not only for the practices, but really also for CMS itself. And CMS is learning from this is one of the reasons they're providing the support for this. So you say, well, what's in it for me if I get involved with the uh, transformation network? Uh, it, it really helps you in the things that Dr. Greenlee probably did all on her own. Uh, TCPI is a grant-funded support, and you say, well, what's a grant-funded support? And I actually had to learn what that meant, and it means that, in this case, CMS is picking up all the expense, so there's no out-of-pocket expense to a practice. Uh, we help with in-practice help, as we're going to see in a minute or so. Uh, we can provide a tremendous amount of resources. We can connect you to other people, for instance, uh, experts like Dr. Greenlee who, who are involved. Uh, you could do this on your own. Uh, people say, well, I don't want to be involved with CMS. Uh, I don't want them in Medicare in my office. Uh, so your options are you know, hiring your own consultant, and you probably don't even think about what that costs. Uh, do it yourself, and unless you're an expert or have spent a lot of time and lived this world, uh, that would be difficult. Uh, or you could just say, you know, to heck with all of this, um, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But as you've seen, these outdated processes are going to go away, and, and sooner or later you're going to hit the wall of what we're doing doesn't work anymore. So the question becomes, how does transformation really help? Uh, because every time I've been approached in the past with, uh, we're going to change your practice, it means uh, I have to do more work. Uh, it means I want to be at the office later. It means I'm going to be sitting at home 
uh, over charts and, and working on things. But we really want to change things, not adding more work to the top uh, of the current load. You know, when I started out in practice, they told me I was the captain of the ship. Uh, what they didn't tell me was that I was personally responsible for pulling up the gangplank, weighing the anchor, and then getting up to the bridge and steering the ship out of the harbor and into the ocean. And frankly, I just don't need uh, any more work. So why get into this? Uh, and I think the big why, the most important part, is improving patient care. I have yet to meet a clinician, a nurse, anybody who really doesn't go to work every day saying, I want to do better for my patients. I want to improve my care. Uh, everybody thinks they do great care. Not necessarily. There's always opportunity, as you saw from Dr. Greenlee, uh, to do better. Uh, importantly, uh, your practice is a uh, business, and so we want to sustain the practice. We want to make sure the business functions well. And lastly, to unload, restructure, and reduce practice burden. Uh, being captain of the ship doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do everything on board. Uh, we can do things differently, and we can improve uh, professional satisfaction. So how do we do this? We do this by working with data. Uh, what, what if your care needs to be improved and reduce waste? How do we do this? We begin to look at data, and, that, and that's really the important part. You know, what do your hospital admissions look like? Uh, what things do you need to do differently in the office? Uh, if you're getting into bundled care or episodic care, which is really coming, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, down the road, uh, we're looking at two years, 2019, Medicare is going to be shifting over, actually based on what happens this year. So Medicare is going to be looking, uh, for instance, at your 2017 uh, data and begin to say, well, that's going to create the payment model uh, for 2019. And, and really, the only way to know how effective your own processes of care are is to begin to look at your own data. Uh, not the data that Medicare supplies, not the data that commercial pairs, so, but using your own data, which for most of us is located right in our uh, electronic medical records. Uh, we just need to learn how to get it out there and use it. Then using our data to see if processes are actually working and, and then monitor it on an ongoing basis. And, and so the way we do this is using QI tools, looking at the way to find the better care. Uh, QI does involve change. There's no question of that. Uh, the example I like to use is a runner going down a road, you know, an unpaved uh, backwoods road, and suddenly there's a gap in the road, maybe a foot, foot and a half apart. It's obviously a big crack in the ground. And the typical reaction is to stop. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, why is the crack there, can I get across the crack, or whatever, but it stops everything, and then you kind of think about it, work on it, and then you kind of make the change. There was fear in approaching the crack that maybe I'll fall down the crack and who knows how deep it is, uh, but once we assess the situation, make a change, we take a bigger step over the crack uh, and then begin to move on. Uh, and so really what we're looking at is a formal approach, a system signals to your team uh, your office staff, that there's change and improvement are important, that we're not just kind of doing stuff on the flyby. I've seen too many offices and probably been guilty of it myself in calling out a change of how a process is going to happen in our office as I go from exam room three to exam room four. And is that really an effective way of making progress change? So we're using improvement science. We're learning new skills, uh, how to improve. We begin to change the team-based care, as Dr. Greenlee said. Uh, the staff is not merely kind of picking up, you know, getting Band-Aids and changing the toilet paper and that kind of stuff, but really having our staff as team members help to care for the patients by performing care at the top of their scope. They do have training. They do have opportunity, and you can really change the roles by defining their roles and responsibilities, creating standing orders. In, in our office, which is primary care, obviously, uh, we began to change standing orders so that our nurses administered flu and Pneumovax vaccine uh, to patients before I got to the office. Nurses were taught how to talk to the patients about it. If patients were agreeable, they went ahead and ordered it and gave it so that by the time I actually got into the office, the immunizations were given. Patients had questions, they could always fall back to me. And in all of this, we begin to share and review data reports to see you know, how we're doing. 
importantly, uh, and one of the things that I think we have the most difficulty with is engaging the patient as a partner, not merely serving as someone from on high talking to the patients uh, as if they were students or lesser than we are. Uh, so uh, we really need to move to involve them uh, in the care, that they feel that they can ask questions. I was often amazed at how many patients, uh, after we got all done, uh, really never had any questions. But then the nurse would come back to me with questions, and when I would talk to the patient later on, call the patient back perhaps, they'd say, well, you're too busy, uh, you're taking care of really sick patients. Uh, I only have diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, and heart failure and depression, so I'm not really sick. You you really got to take care of the sick people. So we really need to be able to engage with our patients and their families. So how do we do all this? Uh, we begin to set up evidence-based protocols, look at recommendations and protocols, hard, hardwire all that stuff into our care plans, into our EHR. Uh, Pre-visit preparations, uh, I think Dr. Greenlee really laid it out, you know, missed appointments, missed opportunities to see uh, patients, you know, a missed, op a missed appointment is, is a loss of income because as, as a uh, physician, as a medical practice, what you're really selling is not knowledge, you're selling your time. And if the time goes by open, it's lost forever. You can never get that again. Uh, we want to work with practices to use IT to help care delivery and communication. So we want to engage the patients in the use of a portal. Uh, why is a portal important? Uh, really think about it. I mean, you probably communicate with your friends and relatives and all kinds of business people uh, on email. It's asynchronous, so you don't have to be constantly answering the telephone. But many practices, we're still back in the Middle Ages, if you will. Uh, patient calls and leaves a message. You call the patient back. Uh, the patient went out to get the kids at school. So they call you back a little later. You call them back a little later. And it's sometimes four and five phone calls. Uh, using a portal, the patient sends you a message and, and you know, example in our practice, a uh, patient with uh, poorly controlled diabetes, we started him on a new medication. Uh, about a half a week later, he sends me an email and says, my sugars have gone from an average of 150, I'm now down averaging 126. My response to him is great. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to send out a prescription to the pharmacy and I'll see you again in about two months and then click save and it becomes part of the patient record. Importantly, to use information and documentation, are you connected to your state health information exchange? In the state of Delaware, that's DIN, Maryland, that's CRISP. I often tell physicians the only reason you want to get in the EHR is so that you can be connected to DIN uh, because that way you get real uh, information in real time. It's literally as it comes out of the testing facilities, out of the radiology department, it comes into your practice, it comes in digitally so it's searchable and you can do research and use it for your data. So really important. So if you're not on your HIE, we can help you with that. Uh, we begin to utilize a shared decision-making tools. Often that's built into our EHR and if not, we can work on that. And again, engaging our patients as we uh, talked about before. So how do we start this patient transformation? Uh, we need to pick something, you know, what really bugs your practice? What, what is an irritant? Uh, how, how do we get over something that's just driving you guys crazy in the office? Uh, the goal is continuous improvement, working to get rid of those irritants, turning your practice into a thriving practice where you enjoy, <coughs> excuse me, enjoy the practice and there's good patient outcomes. And how do we do this? Well, we do it stepwise. The biggest mistake practices made it, make is to try to make wholesale changes, uh, really uh, cleaning the whole closet. Uh, and really, when you think about it, you know, spring is going to be a couple months away. Hopefully, we'll get warmer. Uh, and you're going to start to look at your spring wardrobe, clean out what you're not going to wear anymore or what doesn't fit anymore. But you're not really going to clean out your summer wardrobe or your fall wardrobe at this point. You're going to take a piece of the action. And that's exactly the way we do it, working a piece of the action. How much time does it take? Well, with our advisor in your office, we're asking for a bi-weekly meeting, about an hour with the team that gets assembled uh, to begin to look at the problems and work through them. We work on a 90-day rapid cycle improvement so that hopefully we identify a problem and by the end of 90 days, if not sooner, we've got the workflow changed, we've got an improvement made. Yes, it's a temporary inconvenience, yes, there's a little bit of work to be done, uh, but really the permanent results are better care for your patients uh, and less stress in your office. 
Uh, how about uh, QPP and MIPS? Uh, we can help you in assisting and sending the reports that you need to send out, how to talk to your EHR and registry vendors to get uh, complete reporting done. Uh, by participating with the transformation network, uh, you get at least half the points required for the clinical performance improvement. Uh, so that's, that's a quick and dirty, you know, just playing in the game, uh, you get half the points that you need. Well, I, you know, is this a group thing or is it individual? And the answer is it's absolutely individual. Each practice gets a dedicated practice advisor. Uh, that in turn gets you access to the entire PTN team, so all the different advisors who are working with different practices and the TCPI national faculty and resources like Dr. Greenlee, uh, which is really super to have because I am not an expert necessarily in specialist care, but having Dr. Greenlee as backup is really gives us a way to look at this. So I think there's real opportunity out there, uh, and uh, this concludes our part in there, and so I'm going to turn it back to Kaylin here and uh, for the wrap-up. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sobel. Um, I actually did have one last poll in my um, queue, and I'm going to go ahead and launch that. Um, it just basically is asking, how are you currently engaged with your practice advisors to accelerate your practice transformation? Um, have you completed a transformation project yet? And starting on to your second, uh, are you meeting regularly and working on transformation projects? Or have you not yet fully engaged your begun transformation journey? And I'm going to go ahead and give that two more seconds. Looks like we're pretty steady. I'm going to close that now. And I'm going, show, I'm going to show those results with you before we go into our question. Um, with 29% have completed the first transformation, which is fantastic. We encourage and are excited to start your second transformation project with you guys. 53% um, are meeting uh, regularly, working on transformation projects, which again is fantastic and encourage that great progress. And for the 18% that haven't fully engaged or begun transformation, um, the screen that Dr. Sizzle left up, has all of our practice advisors and as well as Dr. Sobel's um, contact on there, definitely get engaged and get involved. At this time, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to use that raise hand icon and I can open up your line and you can directly speak with Dr. Greenlee or Dr. Sobel or you can go ahead and type a question into the um, question queue. All right, I'm going to have the first um, person who has their raise hand, uh, Cindy. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line. Give me just a second. I lost your name. There we go. I'm sorry, Cindy. It's not allowing me to unmute you for some reason. Maybe you can type your question in the queue or try uh, Calling in again. I'm going to go ahead and move on real quick. Um, Brenda, I'm going to go ahead and click on you. I've unmuted your line, Brenda, if you'd like to ask a question. Hi. Um, I have this question from Dr. Um, Greenlee. Um, basically, that pre-visit advice uh, and preparation is fantastic. I mean, I wish a lot of practices would start using that because I think it would really uh, minimize the amount of wait time for the patient. But my my question to you is, um, how did you find time? Because we you know we always have a busy office. So how do you how did you find time to do that? And um, and um, when did you put it into your schedule? Because a lot of times you're uh, visiting um, or seeing a lot of patients. So um, I actually did it early in the morning. A lot of times uh, I worked with my staff. They they got so that they could recognize if uh, pieces were missing. And I didn't have time to talk about it, but as part of the project that we worked on with Medical Neighbor and High Value Care Coordination, we developed what are called pertinent data sets. And it's sort of the minimal essential data that needs to be included when you refer for a certain condition. And so staff can actually look to see if that can uh, if that uh, material is there. I, um, some of it I did, you know, just intermittently during the day, like type little notes. I always would type the note as part of my EHR that I would send back 
uh, to the referring physician so that they had it documented and I had it documented. Sometimes I talked to them on the phone, but I always gave them an official note. Um, we are, we have presented uh, to CMS even considering having this paid for as extra. With value-based payments, it could be included in the cost, but I'm going to tell you that the time it took to do the pre-visit, pre-consultation is nothing compared to the awful cleanup mess and back-end mess when you've gone down the wrong rabbit hole, when you don't have records. Um, that, so it is an investment, it does take time, but also those awful appointments where you didn't get the records end up taking more time and being much harder to, um, uh, to sort through than sorting through up front. So it is added time up front. We don't often think about that back-end mess when we don't have the records. So I kind of, I had a lot less of that and a lot less of appointments showing up that I couldn't bill for, like that rheumatologic patient. Um, it really, really worked out well for us. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. It's, it's it sounds like you redesigned your um, the the, uh, the flow in the office, which sounds great. Thank thank you very much. One of the things I'll say is that the front desk person was just as much a part of the team as my medical assistant. And we just had, we constantly communicated about our established patients that needed to be seen, but also new patients, so that she would see, the front desk person would see, oh, a pregnant diabetic was just referred. That's an urgent case. I mean, we communicated. Our goal was focused on taking care of those patients, and that made a big difference, too. Thank you. Okay, next I actually what am able to now unmute Cindy. So if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, I've unmuted your line. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, Dr. Greenlee, I was wondering what some of the things you did were to engage your staff or teach them the importance of that team-based care model. You know, if, I guess if we're starting with a staff that isn't really used to that, isn't used to having that responsibility or, or being part of the team, were there things that you did to help engage um, them or teach them about the importance of team-based care? Um, so I almost every time, well, we started with huddles. That's one of the first things that we started with uh, is this meeting. And um, at first I didn't know what to talk about in the huddle. I kind of said, why did I do this? You know, we're going to have a huddle tonight and like, what am I going to talk about? But one of the things I really, really would emphasize is that these are your patients. Um, and then you know, I had to hold them to accountability. And they'll tell me um, that when that clicked inside of them, it made all the difference in the world. And one example was when, when their, their to-do list, instead of looking like a bunch of tasks, in their mind suddenly became taking care of patients. And this patient's out of, you know, insulin syringes, and they had permission, standing orders to refill the syringes or whatever, then they thought, I better get that in or they'll end up in the ER with DKA or something. So they'll tell me the, the huge difference that that made for them. But I started at, in the beginning, it was almost like a broken record that we would be in the huddle and I would just keep saying, now these are your patients. Your job is to take care of the patients. And I would use analogies with them. I, I would say if we were a basketball team, our goal is to make a basket. And your role might be center or forward, but your job is to make the basket. And I would say your role might be getting that patient scheduled in or getting that patient in the room and doing this part of the care. But our, all of our job is to take care of the patient. And once that clicked, it, it was so much more fun for everybody. I love that idea of using analogies. I think that that probably could go a long way with with um, with our staff because it's something that they can relate to. So that's that's great. It does sound too like you maybe use um, so so you share the the practice data with the entire staff. I mean, and that that takes all the way up to the front desk. We're not just saying we oh, we absolutely. share our well, okay, great, fantastic. yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I tell you what, a lot of the improvement ideas came from them, or they already knew 
what was happening. And so I got where I wouldn't even offer anything. I would, first of all, ask, because a lot of times they knew what was happening and why, why it looked the way it did and what we could do to improve it. Thank you. All right, we're going to take, uh, I think, two more questions. I'm going to do one um, from Tiffany. Uh, go ahead, I'm going to unmute your line. Maybe it's not working. I'll go ahead. I think she also sent in her, her message. Um, for Dr. Sobel, can you give me ideas of how I to convince my doctor to join our PTN meetings once in a while? Well, I think if they begin to see the importance of it and if they understand that this is, in the end, less stress for them, less work for them, that they're going to be, have, their day is going to be better. Uh, and they're going to be happier. I, you know, it's a typical physician anymore, and you look in uh, surveys, uh, they're burning out. I mean, the day is just overwhelming from the minute you walk in until late at night when you go home. And if you say, you know, I listen to this, and, you know, like it said in the slides, you know, it's be a little rough road ahead for a little bit, but your day will be better, and you'll take better care of your patients. And I think that, you know, just taking the load off the physician and giving a little time to the proceed to the process really will make a difference, and and in the end they, they will see that. So it, it's a you know and it's an important thing. But I think stressing that it will be better patient care and less stress for them really will make the difference. Great, thank you, Dr. Sable. And last, I'm going to open up the line to one more person. I know we're running a little over right now, so um, Lola has a question. Lola? Good afternoon. This is Lola. Dr. Greenlee, I have a question for you. What steps did you take in order for primary care practices to engage with your practice for better coordination of care? So that's a great, uh, a great question. So within my county, which is only a minority of the patients who were referred to me, we had the IPA uh, care coordination agreement, but most of my patients came from outside my county, so I designed a referral form that asked, and I'm happy to share it with you guys, it just asked for things like, please describe why you want the patient referred, and, and I sent a little letter with it saying, I really want to meet your patient's needs and give you what you want, and to do that, I need to know why the patient's referred, and I need the supporting data. And then my staff and I really, really worked with those practices. And I would a actually have phone calls with them. So we were actually working together. And I'm going to tell you that those outside doctors where we just did this one-on-one -on -one care coordination agreement, it wasn't a formal one at all. Uh, they did incredible because they really wanted their patients to get that better referral and they really appreciated the fact that I cared and was um, willing to help them and considered them important. Um, and so they actually did better, better referrals than the IPA that had the formal agreement, which was a really interesting lesson for me. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Greenlee. That's a fantastic idea. Fantastic. Thank you, Lola. Um, I'm going to put up, I'm sorry, one last time, um, the numbers to the PTN, and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, this time, it will conclude our webinar, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, everyone.